Welcome back to Chapter 3 in Periodic Properties of the Elements. This is the third installment and in this one we're going to look at electron configurations a little bit more as they uh, relate to the transition elements. So when you're looking at electron configuration there are two major categories of these electrons. One is the core electrons, or the ones that are in the inner shells, the lower energy shells. And the other are the valence electrons. And the valence electrons are those in the outer shell. And as we look at it, for example, we've got silicon here as an example. You go to the first field, or to the last, I should say, field P. So it should have a P6 in it. And then everything after that is considered to be valence electrons. So you've got core electrons, and remember these are the ones that are going to be shielding the nucleus. And then you have the valence electrons, which could be actually active and doing something in a reaction. So one of the most important factors in this and how it's going to behave is how many valence electrons it has. So it's important that we can just identify those. So we're going to write the electron configuration for germanium. And then we're going to identify which are valence and which are core. So if you look at your periodic table and find germanium, GE is number 32. So we know from our past lessons that that is going to mean that it has 32 protons and 32 electrons. So we're going to write the electron configuration for 32 electrons. So that would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p now, obviously, I'm pretty good at this, I like to think. So, if you want to, when we're doing these examples, if you want to pause the video and try it yourself and see, and then you can compare with mine and see if you got it right. So, that's one good way of practicing. So, what I'm going to look at is the core versus the valence on this. All right. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go until I find the highest energy level P6 because that's going to be the highest one that's filled, okay? And so if I, if I do that, I find that 3P6 is. So everything to the left of that line I just drew are core electrons. And everything to the right of that are valence electrons. And these valence electrons are the ones that can react and do something when I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Also, if, if you recall, I said that you can go back to the previous noble gas, which is 8A column. And in the case of this one, it's going to be argon. And so argon is basically the core electrons. And then I can just write the valence, which is usually what I'm interested in, here. I can also see that this, this 6 is not filled. So that would be a P with only two electrons in it, right? So that means it has two unpaired electrons. And that's important because that is going to really dictate what kind of reactions the germanium is going to be involved in. So I gave you a practice problem for phosphorus, and so you need to just do the same thing. So the periodic table is basically in orbital blocks. So this is what I call the S block. This is the P block. And remember, if you saw me put those S and P electrons in as I was using the periodic table for that, 
you know what I'm talking about. Then this down here is the D block. It almost kind of sounds like prison when we get to that point. And then down here is the F block. So that's where S electrons are, P electrons, D electrons, and F electrons are located. The group number, okay, is up here, like the 1A, 2A, whatever, okay. And what's really nice about this is if you look at that A number, that tells you how many valence electrons there are. So if you're in group 1A, that means you have one valence electron. If you're in group 7A, you have seven valence electrons, etc., etc. The row number is the shell number. So you know if you're down here in shell number four, then you have filled everything up until you got to that shell number four. But the valence, the outermost, is probably going to be wherever that electron is in that. If, if in the example of potassium, it would be 4s1 because this is going to be s1, s2, just like this is p1, p2, etc., and d1, d2, etc. So this is just another example of doing the electron configurations by using the periodic table. And so I'm just giving you another opportunity to do that. You don't have to do it that way. If you're doing, if you're remembering your, um, the configuration um, numbers as you go along in another technique, you can use that or you can use the periodic table. Either way, as long as you get, get, get whatever works for you and then some more practice. So you can practice, practice, practice those electron configurations. I want to mention about transition and inner transition metals. When I first told you about the periodic table, I mentioned that they don't follow all of our rules. And so they don't. And even with the configuration, they don't follow all of our rules. Some of them have irregular electron configurations because they don't fill all the way. And this is because some of them have what we call a hybrid orbital. And so I've circled some of the um, examples of this because in, in the, most often in the case, what they'll do is they'll only partially fill the S with one electron and then jump to the D. And that's what you see a lot. Um, so typically, if you're doing homework or something and you put it in like it should be and it tells you it's wrong, then it's probably one of these anomalies. And so I just gave you a few examples of this, like chrome. Uh, chromium is one we see a lot. Uh, copper. And notice both of those are, instead of 4s2, 3d9, it's 4s1, 3d10. Same thing with krypton. Um, Krypton can actually do multiple ways, <laughs> um, uh, or I'm mean, sorry, rubidium can do it uh, multiple ways as well. So it just depends on the metal. All right, and so if you, like I said, we're not going to learn all the rules for all of the exceptions, but if you run across one, that's probably what the problem is.